yeah, thanks for coming. Um, I hope this will prove to be a very exciting subject. Um, glad to be here. My name is Amin Astani. Uh, I'm the Senior Manager of Infrastructure Services here at Acquia. Um, I was in the ops team from December 2010 through 2015, so I did ops for a long, long time with Ricardo here up front. Uh, during my tenure there, I uh, formalized the incident response and ticketing process, so wrote up a lot of docs and confluence, um, and you know, created you know, process around things that in a fast-growing company was very haphazard. Um, I also wrote automation tools uh, when I started out to manage a very rapidly growing fleet. Uh, when I started, it was like less than 1,000 servers. Now we're at 17,000 with production and dev, but I think just production, it's just 15,000. Um, last year, I implemented Kanban um, to manage uh, the operations team work in progress. Kanban worked very well because it's very interrupt driven. Uh, and then finally, I'm, I'm right now the, the, tech te uh, the tech lead for the ops tools team, which is an automation team that builds tools for ops to get their jobs done easier. I'm also the people manager for tier two operations, soon to be SRE. So if you were at Ricardo's talk yesterday, he talked a bit about what site reliability engineering is. So metrics, right? Uh, what do you usually think about when we're talking about metrics? Well, usually we're talking about things like utilization, saturation, availability, error rates, and throughput. And we're measuring these things from certain pieces of components in your stack. So talking about the hardware, CPU, memory, all the basics, right? Of course, the um, esoteric stuff in the operating system, like the number of network connections and open files. You might have service metrics, so you're measuring the number of requests you're getting. Uh, cache miss and hit, if you're talking about varnish, and of course, holistically in an app level, what are the HTTP responses? Uh, are you getting click-throughs? Are you getting sales? All that stuff. Um, and why are you gathering metrics in the first place? Well, they help you make decisions. And there's all kinds of decisions that you'd make around data, like should a person get paid? Is the app down due to certain um, service level metrics that you're gathering? Should we, do we need to scale our infrastructure? Are, are, are we running too hot? Uh, in terms of our um, utilization across our fleet. Do we need to revert that last deploy? Are we starting to get you know, 500 errors because there's a bad piece of code that we deployed? Or should we keep that feature? Are we not seeing um, a lot of requests for a particular API point and therefore maybe we should just deprecate it and remove the code and therefore remove liability? Well, here's the problem. It's not the whole picture. So humans are involved in the process of building and operating software. They are essential uh, in terms of keeping a service up and the customers happy. So it makes perfect sense that we should be measuring people also. So it's people metric stuff. What could this accomplish? So let's say you're a manager and you're trying to keep your team engaged and happy and retained. Um, well, these metrics enable you to do a few things. You can be proactive about quality of life issues for your team. So alerts, fatigue, getting paid too much, uh, toil, lots of manual labor in, in, in the day-to-day -day process, et cetera. Uh, it also makes the team status transparent to the rest of the company so that people can see and empathize around what you are doing. It allows you to make justification for additional funding for staffing resources. You can identify that you are you're taking in more work than you're able to do, that type of thing, and also identify opportunities for process improvement, making your team happier through incremental changes over time. Now, let's say you're one of those people that just picked up a copy of the Phoenix Project and you see that there's a serious issue in your organization and you're like, wow, I need to help fix this because I see that there's a cliff and we're approaching it and we need to slow down before we go off the cliff. So if you're that type of person, and you're trying to raise urgency around an opportunity or a problem in your organization, uh, people metrics can do certain things. It allows you to convert anecdotal experience into empirical data. I think that's the number one thing. Uh, revealing the operational cost of current conditions to leadership, being able to express things in dollars. Identify constraints and key business functions. Where are things slowing down? What team is not performing as, as fast as the other teams and making you know, the cycle time for a process to the customer be longer than you'd like? And finally, win members of leadership to your cause, making it so that decision makers are 
you know, rallying with you and, and, and supporting your, your, your initiative and is, are, are willing to dedicate time, effort, and resources to you. A um, couple things. Um, so that little diagram on the right, that's from um, John Cotter. He wrote something called The Eight-Step Process for Leading Change. He wrote a book called Leading Change. Very interesting. Uh, and the first step is establishing a sense of urgency. So these metrics are all around establishing a sense of urgency. If you're a business leader, so if you're you know higher level, uh, people metrics can quantify the level of efficiency your teams have in creating value. How efficient they are? How much time are they spending towards what they're hired for? They allow you to identify where organizational pain points are, so you can see which teams are struggling and need some assistance. They allow you to be equipped with essential data to make tactical decisions. Do you need to create a new team? Do you need to move resources to another project? And finally, ensure customer success because without a successful customer, you're not going to be around. So this set of information is probably the most important out of the whole uh, presentation, so take note. Complaining about a problem isn't going to work. Um, so there's a book by Eli Goldratt called The Goal. And from, the, from that book, there's this quote. The goal of an organization is to increase throughput as in the rate of features or widgets going through the system to the customer's hands while reducing both the inventory, the amount of money that's tied up in raw materials and not translating into value, and operating expense, the cost of doing business. So that's the goal, right? So you have to communicate with leadership in these terms. Throughput, inventory, operating expense. If you can't, con if you can't convey your message in these terms, you're not making it very easy for them to listen. Because again, these are the guys that look at spreadsheets all day. So what can this accomplish? What would influence decision makers more effectively? So let's take on a little story of the two bears. You have the good bear and the bad bear. Well, the bad bear is just going to say, hey, working on Team X really stinks. And we're always firefighting and doing tickets. And it's kind of disruptive. And it's just making a big stink. And you're not really able to back up your point. Or you could be the good bear. 40% of Team X's time is spent in incident response, and 30% of their time is spent in manual tasks that the business needs. That's 74% of their time not spent on making improvements to the product or streamlining current processes. Out of the two subjects here, which one's going to be more successful in getting the change to happen? So let's get into the metrics. So the first metric I want to talk about is the time and effort spent in the four types of work. So how many of you read The Phoenix Project? All right, so a few of you. So if you haven't read The Phoenix Project, you're in, you're, you're in the DevOps track. You're watching stuff from the DevOps track. I highly recommend when you get home, go on Amazon or whatever, pick up a, pick up a copy and read it. Um, so in The Phoenix Project, they talk about there are four types of work that an IT team does. And I argue it's the same for development. There's four types of work for them. And let's go over it briefly. So first thing is business projects. So that's new features. That's doing your job as a developer, creating the software necessary to make the customer happy, and therefore you putting food on the table. The second thing is internal projects. So this is things that improve your ability to do your job, as in cleaning up the technical debt, investment in CI and CD, um, those type of things where you're in reinventing yourself and your process and things like that. And then you have operational change. With any piece of software that you're operating, you're going to have to do some manual steps and things in terms of the upkeep of the system. You're going to have to do releases. You're going to have to configure you know, your stack. You're going to have pro to provision and, and instantiate new instances of your application. Um, that happens. You have to track it. And then finally, the silent killer of every single project out there, unplanned work, AKA outages, firefighting, you know, the big things that make you very, very sad and waste a lot of your time and you're up till three in the morning and it's not good for anyone. So if we actually measure these things, the quantity and the percentage of each type of work over time, and you show it to the business, they are now instantly aware of where their money is being spent and they can see where, if they're getting the return on investment. So, yeah, what do you do with this data? Okay, let's say I have this stuff. So for the first thing, you can actually track the amount of unplanned work you have, and you can start taking measures to keep it to a minimum so you can focus on the things that actually provide value. So there's some priorities here. So let's say you're on a development team. Uh, the priority is to, is to target for maximum time spent on business projects, new features, right? So 
you want to make sure that your maximum amount of time is spent on business, fe uh, business features. But if you need to do some internal stuff to increase this, the, the velocity and speed of the pipeline, that's great. If you have to do releases, that's okay too, but you probably should be investing in internal time in order to, to automate that stuff away. And then finally, unplanned always sucks, and you should never be spending your time on that. And then for ops team, it's a little different. So instead of having spending all your time on business change, because for an ops team, it's like tickets. It's like tasks, right? But if you're spending all your time on internal tasks, internal improvements, you could, in theory, build a series of software st systems that do all your tickets for you, and you're continuing to improve upon yourself, and you're freeing up more and more time to do projects rather than the classic IT model, which is, I'm just doing tickets all the time, and my job is sad. So this is a, this is fake data. I, I um, suspend, to suspend disbelief for just a few moments, and let's say that this is the amount of hours on a per hour basis um, spent by Team X on the four types of work. And we can take a look at this data and we can make some very interesting conclusions. So you can see that unplanned, I actually tried to get Google to make this a red line, but whatever. Um, so unplanned is constant non-zero for this team. So there's always someone hour to hour spending time on incident response or outages or critical failures or whatever. Right, so that's a very interesting thing you can pay attention to. You also have business projects. So if this were an operations team, we'd be talking about you know tickets and getting things out um, to make the to make customers happy, right? And you can see that there are dips and val like dips and mountains and valleys and stuff. It's very unpredictable. And then you have infrastructure change, which is kind of you know happening. And then project time, the thing where you know we're improving on ourselves. There's only like a little bit here. So what would you say? about this team right now. I mean, well, here's the percentage, right? So almost half of their time is on unplanned work. And then, you know, a little bit more of the core of their time is on ticket work. And then you have some schedule work and then you have this little sliver, sliver on improvement. This, is, this team is not happy. For this 24 hour period, this team was really, really sad and doing really, really bad stuff. So just to make the point even more clear, unplanned work is waste. Unplanned work is, well, by definition, work that was not planned by the business to perform. It is taking money and literally throwing it out the window. Every time you have an outage, every time you are, you know, page in the middle of the night because you have a failure in your infrastructure or your app or whatever, you have taken that money and that time and that effort and you have just tossed it out the window or set it on fire. Unplanned work is the bane of your existence and you should work to eradicate it. So here's a quote. Uh, Tom Limoncelli, he uh, worked for Google as a site reliability engineer. Uh, he currently works in Stack Overflow. He's written a lot of books around system administration and recently site reliability engineering. And this is a quote from him. If more than 25% of a team needs to be dedicated to ticket duty and on call, there is a serious problem with firefighting and a lack of automation. So that's just something to put in your minds and think about in terms of when you're gathering your metrics, if you're seeing a good portion of your time spent on handling just tickets or doing outages, there's, there's an issue that you must solve. So you have these four types of work and that can be kind of complicated to track. So let's do something simple. So there's operational load. Now, if you were at Ricardo's talk yesterday, he already explained autom uh, operational load, but I'll go ahead and repeat it for those that are not here or we're not there. So operational load is simply the percentage of time spent towards the upkeep of your service, as in time not writing code or making improvements. So Google, they cap their time at 50% for their SREs. And when exceeded, this work actually overflows to the software engineering team. So why 50%? Well. A very interesting thing is there's this wait time graph from the Phoenix Project that's in the back of the book and is very, very interesting. I thought 50% was a very cool value. So wait time, so that, that, that's like the time that a customer would wait for a request to get done. And I, I mean, this is, just, this is plain queuing theory too. Um, once you exceed 50%, you start to wait a little bit more for your service or for your request to get performed. Now, as you can see, it's equal to the percent busy divided by the percent idle. So when you're at 50%, one over one is one. So you're good. No problem, right? But once you start, you know, going up to 80, now you're at four. If you're going up to 90, you're at nine. 
So once you start getting into the zone where all of your time is spent on busy work and your and your your team is utilized, you're going to be waiting forever. You're going to have a huge ticket queue. People are going to get frustrated and upset and angry, and that's not a place you want to be. So I'll, that's why I think a 50% cap is necessary in SRE teams. Not, I mean, clearly for you know their their career and stuff, but also to prevent this this situation from happening. So Slack is your friend, and I'm not talking about the chat service. Uh, what I mean is actually idle time. So time that you have set aside, um, not marked for anything. So Slack means that your team can be responsive to bursts of unplanned work without a business impact. So how many of you are doing Scrum? OK, so some of you. So are you guys setting aside like um, a buffer just in case there's a bug or something? You guys establishing that? All right, that's good. Because without it, you have one thing come in your sprint that you really have to do, and then you blew your sprint. You didn't complete the stuff you target for, right? So Slack allows your team to be responsive to bursts of unplanned work without business impact. It also allows the opportunity to improve skill sets and morale. If people have a few hours a week to be able to learn about something new, they're going to be happy. They're going to be able to bring it into your team and introduce new ideas. It's good. So the 20th century management style of keeping Slack lean and non-existent, you know, 100% utilization, we're squeezing every last drop out of the team, it doesn't work. What it does actually is it creates constraints. It creates bottlenecks. So flow of work and the, and the rate of requests coming into your team can be very inconsistent. So be prepared. Set aside some slack. So let's talk about another metric. Happiness, right? So this is uh, something that I've, I've, I've deployed uh, at Acquia, and it's been very, very useful, and I want to share it with you today. It's, it's just the happiness metric. So all you have to do is per interval of time, it could be a week, it could be a month or quarter or whatever, it doesn't matter, but you ask from a scale of one to five, how happy are you doing your job? So how happy are you on your team doing the stuff you are, you are doing right now? And then from one to five, how happy are you at working at your company? Are you agreeing with its vision? Are you happy with you know their policies and the procedures and stuff? The community, the culture. And there's some other three questions that are kind of useful. They're not something you can plot on a graph, but they're cool. So. What makes you the most happy? What makes you the least happy? And then what single thing, if changed, would most greatly increase your happiness? Which is kind of like, hey, what do you want me to go fix for you so you stay, right? So that's kind of a good thing to ask people. So why, sure, this is all touchy-feely. Why, why, why do this? So the first thing is it allows you to quantify common morale of the team. You're able to do some math and figure out, hey, everyone's kind of hanging out at a three or a four. What is it that we can do to make things better? And you know you can see changes of people's morale over time as new initiatives or certain crises or certain situations have popped up. So you can see their effects. Um, you're also able to identify improvement opportunities. If everyone's saying, hey, what would make me really, really happy is if we had a foosball table. I don't know. And if they all suggested that and then you implemented it, you probably are going to make them happier. Um, and then, of course, you're going to be preventing burnout and em employee turnover by addressing the problems that are, you know, serious that they've indicated. And it all also allows for a safe place for people to sound off on team issues, um, especially if you allow anonymous submissions. So at Aquia, when we started doing this for operations team, we had a field that pretty much said, you can put your name in here if you want. Um, but we're not actually going to record who submits this. So if someone comes in, doesn't record their name, and is frankly, like just frank honest about the current situation that's going on for them, we have key data and they can feel confident and have a level of trust that we're not going to use that data to some nefarious end. Uh, employee turnover is really, really, really expensive. So if you have good talent on your team, you should do everything you can to keep them and keep an eye on them. And these types of metrics make it easy for you to do that. This isn't a replacement for one-on-ones and actually meeting with your team, but it allows you to calculate to get, get yourself a baseline and provide opportunities for discussions and initiatives later. So there's a bunch of other metrics that we can go over, and I'll go over them briefly, but I wanted to just talk about the primary three because I think those are the big you know, quick hits that if you implemented them, you're going to be equipped to, to communicate with other teams and your leadership to make change. So you have cycle time. Right? So that's simply how long will a customer wait on a request? 
uh, you got throughput, the requests perform per day, week, or month. You know, how many widgets is the team churning out? Uh, frequency by re request type. What should be automated first? So if you got, you know, 20 types of requests in a week, that's probably a candidate to look at the process and figure out how to optimize it, fully automate it, or at least tool assist it. Frequency by root causes. So we're talking about incidents, right? So what's causing the most pain? Uh, oh, this particular subsystem, maybe this database or this compo or um, you know component of the stack is always causing troubles. If we can see that's where the pain is coming from, then we know okay, we should probably start paying attention to you know investigating this particular portion of the stack and uh, work on fixing it over any other thing. Reopened issues or bugs. How often are defects going downstream? You know, is there uh, process failures? Or is there an issue with a particular piece of software? What's the impact? of your current state of your process or your software. And then finally, a very interesting one is time spent for customer. Imagine you, you had everyone track their time and you're able to attribute requests to a particular customer. You can then calculate what the operational overhead it is to have a particular customer. And then you can calculate whether or not they're profitable. Very interesting. So hopefully I've won you over on this stuff and you're like, man, I wanna do this how do I get started? I will tell you. So six steps. I'm not going to say it's easy, but they're clear. So the first thing you got to do is you got to track your work in a ticketing system. Uh, how many of you don't track your work in a ticketing system? Good. It's okay. You can talk to me later and we'll hug it out and we can get you set up. It's okay. So it's question one of the ops report card for a reason. If it isn't in a ticket, it doesn't exist. And that's really important when starting this. All of your work has to be tracked in the ticketing system so you have a single place of information to query to get your stuff. So uh, there's several things. Oh, I have like, I duplicated the slide and I forgot to remove some stuff and I'm really sorry about that. So I'll move on. Um, the second thing is uh, logging time. So you have your ticketing system and you're tracking all of your stuff in there. Great. Well, now you should probably track your time spent on each issue that you work on. Uh, so for ops and SRE type people, it's important that they track all of their time. Um, so that way that you're able to see what percentage of their time is actually like the toil and the stuff that Ricardo and I have talked about. Um, developers should probably just track their time spent performing the non-coding tasks. That's okay, because then you're able to figure out how many you know dollars or hours spent on the stuff not coding. But tracking time sucks. Um, yeah, it really does, but it still needs to happen. And there are some tools out there that, that make uh, tracking time uh, a lot easier. Uh, Toggle is one of them. Uh, we use Toggle at Acquia. We also, so it's, uh, it plugs into Jira and there's some nice buttons that you can click and there's some reports and it makes it a little bit easier for you to track your work. You can also write tools that integrate with your ticketing system to make that much more ergonomic. So what we have um, is a very simple Ruby tool and any ticket that a comment or a group of comments was made on for a given day, but there's no time tracking, um, we actually generate YAML files and email them to the engineers and then the engineers feed it into this utility. And then it simply says, hey, on this ticket, you said these comments, how long do you think it took to do this work? And then they're able to actually reconcile and you can get your data back. Um, you got to emphasize over and over why time tracking is important. Uh, just saying, oh yeah, you got to track your time is not very motivating and people aren't going to do it. But if you're telling them that, hey, if you give me this information, it's going to be easy for me to get you more staff. It's going to be easier for me to get you more automation and more tooling and more resources. Then they're going to be motivated to do it. And of course, you can always bribe them and provide incentives to accurately track time. But be very, very careful. Never, ever, ever, ever use time tracking data as a weapon. Never go and say, oh, if you're not tracking in hours a week, then you're not working. If you set up a, an environment like that, you're going to get bad data and you're undermining your team's trust. Step three. So you got your ticketing system. You're tracking your time. The third thing you can do is you can track non-issue-like data using custom tools. So there are time series databases like StatsD slash Graphite, and there's also Influx for those that are into that, and they're really useful. So you can write code um, or, or basic utilities and tools to emit metrics um, in, into these systems for graphing and stuff. 
Uh, in the worst case scenario, you can use Google Forms, and I'll talk about that later. So, okay, now you got all your data. You got your ticket data, you got your non-issue tracker related data that might be relevant, and now you can make a dashboard out of them and do something very interesting. So Grafana is a very useful tool for this, especially if you're using uh, the StatsD Graphite stack. Um, if you're using Jira, I know some of us are, uh, you can create widgets um, for your dashboard and you can set those up and, and you'll be able to get some key team metrics there as well. Um, so yeah, get you know, a television and a little Raspberry Pi or whatever and display this data in a prominent space at your office, right, where people are walking by and see it. And make sure that you have some form of basic documentation or very clear description of what this data means. The goal, the reason why you want to do this is so that you're generating empathy for your team's current state. I can go and walk by and I can look at your team's dashboard and say, wow, they had a really tough day today. What is it that they do exactly? You know, what type of work are they doing? How can I help? So being able to get the information in their face is huge in being able to, to motivate change from a grassroots point of view. So you got all this data, you got the dashboards, you have some stuff in your face that you can look at. Now you have to interpret it and you need to communicate it. So Reviewing them daily or weekly as part of your stand-ups or your agile process or your weekly meetings or whatever is going to be very, very useful because it's going to allow you to look at that and then start asking questions about particular anomalous metrics. Uh, so you can say, oh, look, there was a big spike of unplanned work. Why is that? Well, on that day, there were these incidents. Wow, that was really expensive. Maybe we should look into that. Um, it allows you to make it possible for you to articulate the information that you're, that you're gathering in the form of a story, right? Because back in the, in the slide with the two bears, being a, just saying, oh yeah, I'm firefighting isn't very useful. But if you're able to say in a form of a story, hey, this code push caused this many hours of unplanned work this week and we weren't able to get those tickets out that we promised the customer, that's a really clear story to tell. Um, and then you can take this data and you can share it with management. So now you have to approach management. Now, how, how do you do that? Well, remember, they care about operational cost, inventory, and throughput. So you have to speak in terms of time and money. So you can say, if you're able to articulate in these example statements, you're going to have a lot of power. $5,000 of Team X's time is spent rebooting servers due to bug Y. <laughs> Customers are waiting up to two weeks for Team X to fulfill requests. It takes one hour on average to perform task X. And we need double our usual EC2 costs while bug X is unresolved. So time and money. Step six. So you can define a target condition, which is pretty much a very elaborate way of saying a, a, a goal um, and working towards achieving it. So target conditions are something that I learned from a book called, called Toyota Kata. So it talks about um, the coaching kata, the way, that, the form in which they uh, have their team solve problems. So what a target condition is, is if you have these metrics, you can now say, hey, I want the cycle time of issues being performed for the customer to be reduced from the current state, you know, a week average cycle time to one week average, or like from half a week average cycle time. And we want it. We want to be able to get that done in three months. So it's pretty much just saying, I have a metric where it is now. I want the metric to be in a certain place, and I want a you know a time box on when we want to achieve this. So it's a very interesting effect. You want to set your 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 target condition not so close that it's really achievable, and it kind of kind of lends your, your, your thinking to certain solutions that you kind of already have in your head. It's just a little far out, out of reach so that you start thinking creatively about, well, how can we make this possible? Um, and then you're able to iterate using the PDCA method or pretty much a scientific method to iterate and make changes one at a time until you reach your, your target, right? So examples of a target condition is to say, okay, we want to reduce the operational load to less than half in six months or reduce the 90th percentile cycle time on tickets to one week and three months. So I have a, a reference at the end about the Toyota Kata book. Uh, it's a good book. It's very interesting, especially if you like plant manufacturing for some reason. Maybe I'm the only one. <laughs> so, okay, seriously, show me how to do these things so I can make dashboards and impress my boss. All right, let's do it. So quick, quick, and dirty. Um, so how many of you write Bash, or at least are 
Okay, we still got some of you. So, um, a really cool thing about Graphite, and you probably already know this, um, you can just netcat some UDP packets to the port, and you can start making graphs right now. So, there's nothing stopping you from writing really simple scripts or putting little hooks in your code uh, to send integer or float values to a machine and graph it. So, I mean, here's a really simple one. Um, if I run this, it will read in an, a number, and then it'll go and plot it on a graph for me. Right, So this uses statsd gauges, which once you set it, it will remain at that value until you change it again, which is very useful. There's another example, which is counters. So you know, rate of incidence of certain things. So a very common thing for system administrators to deal with is interruptions. People come up to your desk. I mean, you build your career, a career around being helpful, being the guy that can answer any question. But there's a little consequence, which people just come up to your desk and say, hey, you got a sec? Usually you don't, but you don't want to be mean, so you kind of take the interruption. So there was a period of time in which I was like, hey, I'll just go and run a script every time I interrupted, and I can watch the interruption rate over time, and that might be useful data to have. So this uses counters. So if you, and it just sets one. So as you, as you go and you continue to run this metric, it will start plotting or making spikes in certain periods of time so you can see where the frequency is taking place from a time aspect. So again, Real simple stuff in Bash. Um, so yeah, I actually have an itty bitty little demo. So let's run this stuff and see what happens. So I'm not pulling a bait and switch on you. So here's the happiness. I, all I did was just do some helpful message. Hey, how happy are you? And then we take it in. Real simple shell script. So I'm going to go run this. Let's say it was a really bad day, and it's a 2. And let's say that the reason that I had a bad day actually was because I got a lot of interruptions. So I'm going to get I'm going to interrupt myself a whole bunch. I mean, you got a sec. Hey. Right? So a bunch of people came up to my desk no asking for, asking for some help because Yeah. Exactly. So here we go. So now we're going to go back. Sorry, tiling. Um, all right, so I have a Grafana dashboard that I set up with these metrics. Um, so if I refresh this, look at that. So I ran, I ran this, and you can say, oh, look, my happiness is at a two. That's bad, right? <laughs> and look, I'm being interrupted. I got a bunch of interruptions. It takes a little while for, 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 for Graphite to actually, like, flush and persist everything to disk. So when you render the graphs, there's like a little bit of a delay before you actually get the true metrics. But as you can see, I interrupted myself four times. And there you go. It's right there. And, and I'm, I am a happy, I'm happiness level two, which is not great. So if you had your team generate these metrics in some means like this, you're able to see as a group and individually what's going on. So I fired this up in a Docker container this morning. Um, it was really easy to generate this, so I think it'll be really easy for you folks to do so also. But that bash stuff was really, really awful to read, and I, I, I might not be a programmer at all, and I really want to do this metric stuff, but I can't. What can I do? It's not a problem. So if you're using Jira, there's lots of reporting capabilities built in, there's documentation, and there's plugins, so you can do things from within Jira if you have to. Um, there's some also some business intelligence tools. Uh, we use Domo, so we actually feed our Jira data into Domo and do some analytics and get all kinds of information. There's also Amazon Quick Sight, which they released last year, if you want to use their service to do business intelligence. And then, again, there's Google Forms. And I'm serious. This is actually really useful, and I'm going to show you. I'm going to make a new form. So I'm going to call it happiness metric. All right. So we're going to do exactly what we were talking about in the slides. So how happy on team? 
linear scale, this is kind of cool, cool. So one to five, right? It's pretty straightforward. And then I could duplicate it. All right, so we got that linear scale again. So I'll make a new one. Paragraph, duplicate that, duplicate that again. Okay, so now we just go use it. Where's the, they changed it recently. Give me some trick. Preview, there you go. So let's say I'm in the middle about what I'm doing on my team, but I'm really jazzed up about what I'm doing in the company and what makes me most happy is puppies and kittens. <laughs> and what makes me least happy is outages and what if change will mostly increase your happiness? Um, unicorns, I don't know. Okay, so I submit this. Cool. The responses. I got graphs right off the bat, right? How long did it take for me to do this? Maybe a minute, maybe two of, of dead air, and we have a means to gather metrics on your team. You didn't have to write a single line of code. You didn't have to do anything elaborate, and you can start getting metrics. So let's talk a little bit about JIRA. So how many of you use JIRA again? I don't know if I asked. Okay, so I got a bunch of you. All right, cool. So. I use and abuse the JIRA API. I do all kinds of crazy stuff. If you're interested, talk to me uh, after. So um, it doesn't have everything you need. So if you want to mine for some interesting little goodies in the database, there's some stuff you should, you should know. So let's say you wanted to do the, the matching of the comments in an issue with time tracking. So what you have to do is you need to look at two tables. There's the work log table, so that's a track time tracking table, and the JIRA action, which is where the comments are stored. So if you're able to figure out, okay, here's the work log for the issue for the day, and here are the comments in the issue for the day, and you can match them up. Okay, that guy tracked time, but if you have items in the JIRA action, but no items in the work log, then you know they need to track time. I can't share source code for what I have, but I think that should give you enough to get started. There's a bit more. So Remember that graph, that simulated graph that I showed a little while ago? So that actually exists on my team. Um, there, it wasn't, there was no good functionality generating this in the JIRA API. So I actually had to talk to the database directly. So if you want to set this up, this is what you have to do. So in JIRA, for your issues, you create a custom field called work type. And you do business, internal, ops change, and unplanned. So in the JIRA database, you have to join work log .issue ID against custom field .issue and then you're looking for specific custom field values mapping to each of those things. And they're gonna be stored in some weird representation because it's JIRA. Um, and then if you sum all of these things together uh, by you know, the, the time spent in the work log, um, you can aggregate the time spent over whatever time frame you want for a specific type of work, and then you can push the data to a time series da database like in the, in the, in the uh, batch scripts. So, with that, you're gonna be able to figure out, hey, over the last week or over the last 24 hours, over the last quarter, where have people been spending their time? And that's gonna be really huge when you have to go to your boss and say, hey, I think I probably need more people, or hey, there's something we need to fix. So if you have JIRA, you have means to do it, but it's gonna take a little bit of work. So there's a bunch of books that led uh, to me putting together this presentation, so I'll share it with you. Uh, the Phoenix Project is like the book. It's like the gateway drug to DevOps. If you haven't read it already, please get it because it, it's going to um, really open your, your eyes into you know, a new way of thinking in terms of doing your job, especially if you're in IT or software development. There's also The Goal, uh, written by Eli Goldratt. It's like the proto, it was, it was the Phoenix Project in the 80s. Actually, the Phoenix Project was modeled after The Goal, so it talks about the theory of constraints um, and he has his own system around um, setting the pace of work and things like that. But 
uh, it's still really, really good read, and I highly recommend it. There's also the practice of cloud system administration, which is this big tome that talks about architecting systems as well as operating them, and it talks about all kinds of interesting stuff uh, relating to toil and uh, tracking your time and automating stuff away. You also have Scrum, the art of doing twice the work in half the time. That's where I think I got the happiness metric from. Uh, and then Toyota Kata, which I talked about, uh, which talks about the PDCA method. Uh, and finally, Kanban, for those that do use it. Um, very awesome book, especially for interrupt-driven teams that need to be able to track their work and you can't put things in a sprint. So I also added the links in here so you guys can get it after the uh, I share the slides. So um, yeah, I, I hope you guys really enjoyed this presentation. Uh, I really appreciate you coming. <laughs> Yeah, someone at Aqui actually photoshopped my face on that. That was really cool. Uh, so I just want to motivate you folks. If, if you guys are in a, an interesting situation where you see that there is a problem and you don't quite know how to articulate it to people in order to make a decision or a change happen, well, congratulations. You now have those tools. Go forth and conquer. Questions? And please, oh, thank you. Um, so, yeah, I do have a, I know you guys probably have a bunch of questions. Just make sure you queue up in the microphone so we can record it and people can hear. Yes, uh, thanks. Very useful. Um, Thank you. So my question is how, how would you implement these things for small teams? Because, you know, like, my team is, like, seven people. Sure. So when you bring this information, then it's so easy to tell who was not happy or, you know, I mean, like, you figure these things out very easily when you have such a small group. Right. So it's how you communicate these things and how you use this information and, and, and to make it there. So it's, that's what, the, you know, that one question is how we make these things more applicable to a small team. And also the small teams, I think there is, I have seen this culture, which is people are a little bit loose in the time, right? It's not like, like big operations, Acquia, sure. you know, all of these. Th it, people are more loose, but they are also more flexible when you need them. So how you how you manage those things, like from moving people into being so loose into doing a lot of tracking time and so on? Sure. So um, you have to approach it from two angles. You have to give them an incentive and a reason to be able to, to be willing to have the discipline to track their time. At the same time, you're going to want to be, you're going to want to understand, you know, what, what tools you already have in your arsenal and like how you do your work and build tools and process to enable them to do so. For me to just to go up to my team and say, hey, you're going to track your time and you're going to use this product, they're going to say no. But if I say, hey, if you do this, we can get more headcount. Or if I do this, I can go to my boss and say, hey, there's a problem. If you do this, I will give you $100 if you have, you know, tracked all your time at the end of the week and I roll a D20 and your, and your number comes up. Like, it might take a little bit of bribery, but you have to con continually and consistently communicate the reason why um, and, and for your team to to understand the purpose and the, and, the, and the goal behind it and to know that this is a tool for you, their boss, to enable them to be happy. They're going to be motivated to do it because it's like, okay, I'm going to give him what I, what I need to, for me to be successful as an engineer. So you have to set that up. Now, for small teams, you're asking about small teams. Um, I mean, if you are in a situation where you have – a culture of distrust where they're like, look, I'm not going to go and, and submit my true feelings because that might single me out. Well, I mean, first, that's something you have to, you, you, ha you have to fix. You have to fix that. Like if, if, and, and work and building relationships and building an atmosphere of trust so that you can talk openly about these things. Um, and if, the, and while work is in progress, then you could take the arithmetic mean of the numbers um, or take very basic themes out of the out of the text submissions and say, hey, here's some correlations around the data. Here's the general tone. Um, and it's really cool to share uh, a digest of the data with the team as a whole. Because first, you're saying, look, I have paid attention. I spent enough time to put together the data and to, and to you know, tell you. And it also gives them an opportunity to maybe um, reiterate points they weren't able to clearly convey. So it's a bit on the culture side and a bit on meeting them in the middle with the processes and tools you have. It's not easy, but it's definitely well worth it. Ricardo? Uh, it's kind of touching your question and asking a question to Amin. Um, so this is all a part of culture. So if you don't start with the culture now, 
this will be really, really hard to implement. And the culture starts with honesty and like people have to trust you. Like I know this, you're probably a project manager or a manager in that level. People need to trust you honestly. Like, I mean, has been on our team, is been a leader. Everybody trusts him. And when Amin says, hey guys, this is really to help you. Like, we don't have a slight uh, point of distrust to point him in the past that will say, no, he's not trying to help us. No, he is trying to help us. So this worked because your manager, you can trust them, right? And you, you have to build those bounds of trust. Like you have to show your team that they are a part of the solution, not a problem. If there is a problem, then process should fix it. Process, automation, all of those things that will remove toil and unplanned work from, from the way. Because sometimes people don't work because they are blocked. And your work is to unblock them, right? So my question to Amin is mm -hmm. how were in the beginning, like before we have this, yeah. how did things work? So before Kanban? Yeah. So prioritization was based on a lot of Screamer. Um, and there were a lot of, you know, discussions in, in unseen places to try to get people's time to work on things. Um, with a lack of visibility, people just assumed that ops were just lazy or they didn't care or whatever. But by, you know, so those were having an opaque team, having a team that's just like file a ticket and having that, that standoffish relationship between the, the, the customer facing teams or the stakeholders between, between them and the ops, it, it really eroded confidence both ways. Now, by going and, and, and having data and being transparent about your day-to-day -day work, you're able to start creating a dialogue um, and to start putting, you know, having opportunities for empathy where people can see, wow, these guys are really doing a really good job. It's just there's all of these impediments. So you're inspiring those folks to, to find opportunities to help you because by helping the team, they're helping themselves by enabling them to unblock them or to enable, you know, customer success or any of those things. Yeah, no worries, man. Um, I'm, yeah, uh, great talk. Um, Thank you. I'm having a, I'm uh, sitting on the other end and not, not in uh, operations, but in development. And sure. Uh, just have a team of around 20 people. Yeah. I would really like to implement uh, some matrices, but it, it, I kind of stall when we begin to talk about, you know, tickets and, and how, because of course we're using Java and Kanban, but it's hard to quantify what type of tickets you have in projects and what your projects going on and on and so on. So the, the part about how to, you know, uh, sh what works makes people happy and not happy is, I think, a bit hard to uh, quantify it. So. Well, sure. I mean, that's why in the happiness metric, three questions were non, like, numerical values. So, sure, you're going to be able to, I mean, the, the happiness in a team and happiness in a company is, is a real general, you know, barometer around, okay, where, where are the uh, people's general sense at? And that can change week to week depending on what's going on, right? So it's, it's kind of a loose metric. But um, when taken as a group, you start seeing some very interesting trends over time. Now, the other questions that are text-based, I mean, it's tantamount to a suggestion box. And you can look at those and you can start grouping them into themes, like... Uh, this is around how meetings are being conducted, and this is around how, you know, when, you know, how early I have to wake up and come into the office or commute or whatever. So by being able to look at that and figure commonalities, then you start, you're able to put together a series of continuous improvement opportunities where over time, you're going to be able to make your, your, your team happier, or at least um, reset expectations about what your, you know, what you are expecting as a manager. Uh, so that way they can at least know if they're in the right place. Uh, I'd ask for practicality. How often do we ask these questions? So these questions are now asked 
by the whole company on a quarterly basis, um, which was really cool. They, they started doing this and, and gathering metrics, and we were able to actually go from team to team and be like, okay, so this team feels this way and this team feels that way, so it, it, it's being done quarterly. Um, also, in on tools team, which I lead, we do it every two weeks, so at, as part of the retrospective process of a sprint, we then go and ask, you know, one to five happiness, real straightforward, so that way um, you can see correlation between what happened in the sprint and their current morale, because there might have been a story or a piece of unplanned work that really burned them or something. Thanks for the talk. Thank um, you. My question is kind of about just at a really high level, like when you were rolling this out, it, it went from kind of throwing stuff over a wall, not tracking work, to uh, kind of like what happened and kind of what order at a really high level, like how did how did the rollout happen? Yeah, sure. So. Um, the first thing that we did is we established Kanban because we needed to get control over work in progress and be able to visualize the basic metrics of what the team did. So we're talking about ops, right? So the things that people are going to be concerned with was how many tickets did they do? Because if you know that on a day-to-day -day basis for Kanban, excuse me, for Kanban, you can say, okay, how many more tickets can we replenish the queue with, right? Because you have to limit work in progress in a Kanban board. Um, so we started doing that April 2015, um, so a bit over a year ago, and that was taking the wool off of a lot of people's eyes because they started to realize, man, we don't have a dedicated team that just does our stuff. We have a team, a, a, a team that is shared a, amongst multiple stakeholders with multiple perspectives and multiple goals, multiple products, and now they have to communicate with each other to figure out what's most, most important to the business. So that was step one. Just doing that, and we were we were graphing, we were graphing the Kanban throughput, and we were like, "Hey, look, there's a big dip. What happened?" So that led to the four types of work. So we started metricing that. So we started adding the the four types of work to the tickets, and then we started classifying them, and um, we monitor, you know, the the count of the tickets that are created, as well as the time spent on them. Uh, and then we have some tools that remind people to track their time on issues that we find that haven't been tracked for a given day or whatever. And then we have this nice little graph where things are crossing around and going around and, and, and you can see relationships. Um, and that was huge because then I was able to take that graph and share it with people in engineering and share it with people in leadership. Like, look at this. This is where the team is at. And as a result, it created a, a huge sense of awareness around, okay, now we know this. Now we know what we need to do in terms of taking action. So it started with just how we interface with other teams. And then we started gathering more and more data as the need and opportunity came up. And then it allowed us to tell a clear story. Thank you. Uh, so we have a little bit more time, I think. Um, any other questions? Um, my time is your time. I want to make sure you get every last drop of value out of this talk. Sure. So the question was, um, what are we doing with the JIRA API? So I will tell you. Um, so a few, so of, of course we do some basic JIRA API calls for, hey, are there any issues that are like fires we should pay attention to? And we can graph that, real simple stuff. Um, but there's a couple projects that came out of the JIRA API. The first one um, was a tool-assisted automation mechanism where we had a REST API and you can make calls to do certain things. Um, and then we had a client and a chat notification saying, hey, there's some stuff in the queue, and it reduced some of the work into a yes or no question. Should this change happen or should this change not happen? If And if the engineer said, yep, it just took place. So it reduced... It reduced all of the work and the toil from like, okay, I got a ticket and I have to figure out what happens, what, what's supposed to happen, and then get the docs and then do it to this is the request, is it a valid one? And then it simply implements it and closes it. So that increased ticket throughput and eliminated a lot of the work by like 10, 15% right off the bat after we launched it. The second thing, and this is something we're working on right now, um, JIRA has, you can set required fields for JIRA, of course. Um, for each ticket type, but we felt that that made it it was made it kind of cumbersome. It isn't like Jira configuration is version controlled. So we did something very interesting. We um, created a JSON schema web form, a JSON schema based web form, so we can create 
pretty much a bill of materials for ticket types and throw them in a folder and it would do it would present a form it would render a form saying okay this is the type of work that you're asking for and here's the required fields you have to fill out and it did validation uh client side in javascript and then it did validation server side um in the app so what what that meant is you're clearly telling people this is what we need in order to do the work and then we're validating that that information is complete via schema and then we actually went reached out to jira and made the ticket and filled out all the forms for them and all the fields and all the stuff that people don't want to do. And then we 301 redirected the person into that ticket. So what that did is it made it very, very easy for people to ask for stuff to get done without thinking about the process because we don't want to burden people with, you have to go into Confluence and you need to read this page and then once you totally understand it, then you can go file this ticket or we're gonna go yell at you. I mean, that doesn't work and doesn't serve the customer well. So those are the things we're doing with Jira. Um, and yeah, the Jira API is well documented and it has served us quite well. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, I got one. Oh, thanks, man. Okay. I'm going to leave this in the desk because they asked me to leave it. To the... oh, yeah. Thanks, man. I'm happy you got this. Thank you. It was a pleasure to serve.